Greetings, goons, gangsters, and gamers. It's your boy, The Goods Tonight. Today we're doing sort of the long-awaited and uh, to an extent much anticipated review on the hard-headed veterans above the year generation two, which has been somewhat modified, but we'll get to that here in a minute. So this is a video that's required me to give myself effectively several migraines and headaches, reading into and studying all sorts of ballistic information, particularly regarding helmets and all basically what it takes to be a decent ballistic helmet. And I've got notes and I've never got notes. This is usually just a massive stream of consciousness ordeal. So if I've got notes, we've got some important stuff. So this isn't exactly organized into a script, but it does have everything that I wish to cover within this review because there is a lot to talk about. So hard-headed veterans, as you may have guessed, is run almost entirely by veterans and law enforcement founded back in 2014 with the stated goal of getting, well, competent ballistic head protection out to the uh, general populace. And, well, even the active day. They do uh, do military discounts. I haven't had a chance to look too much into that. This helmet in particular was lent to me by one of my buddies to do this review on, so a special thanks out to him. We will not be named by name because I didn't ask him if he wanted a shout out or not, but it's important to let you know this is a helmet I'm borrowing. I did not pay any money for it. And um, yeah, I want to, I basically wanted to have this to take a few, a look at a few things to cover within this video because this is one part deep dive into what it, what all goes into ballistic helmets testing um, effect, effect, eff, efficacy. I know that word, efficacy. Uh, this would be easier if I just use small words the entire time, wouldn't it? And, uh, yeah, um, all that sort of stuff. And, uh, compare it to more or less our Opscore SF helmet that I very much love and did spend money on, so. <laughs> it's important to do this comparison, so I took down all these notes to cover why they, well, the things they're, the things they went ahead and, and did, the, uh, potential stated reasons why they did them, a few assessments here and there as to why these things happened. And there's a lot to know about ballistic helmets, and I'm not gonna, I had to have, reach a stopping point on that rabbit hole, or I would have, it would be another six or seven months before I get this video done, so. This time I actually have a ruler system in place. I'm in the middle of moving apartments, so the key ruler I needed for this video is vanished in one of these boxes behind the camera. And uh, yeah, we'll get around to that. So, Hard Hit Veterans 2014 say, hey, we're gonna start, we're gonna find a inexpensive way to produce these helmets. Now we have seen something like this done before in particular with AR-500. However, there is a pretty significant divide here because AR-500, the initial sort of like impact of that was like, hey, let's get ballistic plates to the average person. The plates won't save you, they won't keep you unalived, and they're way, way too heavy, you won't be able to carry anything else, and you're probably still going to get unalived from shrapnel fragmentation, spalling, and all that stuff anyway. And you're also going to be really, really tired too. So I was going to do a review on those as well, but I think we're kind of beyond that point that's beating a dead horse at this point. Everyone kind of knows they suck, they ran a pretty significant defamation campaign against ceramic plates, which was all... Uh, also looking into this video and stuff all got proven as wildly untrue so how does HHV go about making these helmets and stuff so obviously the helmets are made out of American material great but uh composed in China okay so let's take a look at this so when it comes to Chinese manufacturing for stuff like this um generally there's two ends of the spectrum on uh, one end you've got Olight <laughs> which I think if you watched my previous videos, you know my opinion on them. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got um, Hollow Sun. Now, when it comes to Hollow Sun, people absolutely swear by it. They um, really like to compare it to the Trigicon, particularly in the regards to the RMR. And it does have a little shake awake. It's got the little disc slide tray. And basically, you grab Trigicon and you go, hey, innovate or get out of the way. So. I, I did like the fact that they're forcing Trigicon to go ahead and innovate now, so they can't just like rest on their laurels. And yeah, I've seen a lot, saw a lot of the testing videos and stuff. They run, they ran the uh, Hollow Suns pretty ragged, hoping they would fail and were able to actually keep them up and running. So pretty cool. On the opposite end, you've got Olight, who likes to buy influencers and subscribers and will effectively positive reviews. Uh, they have some significantly shady business practices and they literally say, hey, 
we're going to hyper focus on big lumen number and if you're one of those flashlight nerds who cares about things like lux and throw and spill and hot spots and all, all that nerd fancy lingo gizmo stuff then uh, this isn't a light for you but it's cheap and we're going to market it as a rifle light so yeah um so when we get into hhv helmets a lot of people when they go here they hear made in china and if you're like me you're incredibly skeptical you go okay well made in china don't want to deal with it is the initial reaction i had but we should do our best to push past our biases and uh engage with reality effectively you if you're not engaging with reality and you're in your own magic world then when reality hits you well Reality wins 10 times out of 10, so... Biases aside, I decided to start pushing to the deep dive, look into this different stuff, and one of the uh, key claims they have made is that the HSV helmet fares better against back face deformation than the Safari helmet. Or not the Safari helmet, I'm thinking Safari helmet right now, than the Opscore Gentex SF helmet. And I was like... Really? And that kind of what was the... Uh, spark point that kicked off this whole deep dive and several months of headaches. So let's focus on the HHV helmet for a moment. So 2014, they come up with the Gen 1 and much like several of the helmets that were coming out at the time, because um, they had, uh, they stated they started with Mitch helmets because the Mitch helmet was designed to integrate with EarPro, a modular integrated communications helmet. Makes sense. Problem is Mitch helmets still made out of almost entirely of DuPont Kevlar have the wider ears to accommodate the ear pro and it still sucks to wear ear pro under them a lot this was before we were mounting stuff to helmets you know so in order to sort of like work around that in 2010 i believe around the tw around 2010 opscore gentex comes out with their high cut helmet super high speed and china immediately goes and starts making copies so yeah being able to mount your stuff directly to the helmet it's cool stuff i mean Look how far we've come. They even mount to the back. Those things that did nothing. They had uh, they used them to hold beer cans at one point. <laughs> yeah, now we're somewhere else entirely. So, cool stuff. So, China's pointing out their knockoff helmets. And um, HHV looking to enter the market. They go, hey, we can uh, produce better helmets in China if we use American material. Use uh, actual brand name Dewpoint Kevlar, which is what I'm assuming they're using. As opposed to the general Aramid fibers that the nameless, brandless Chinese companies are using to produce their replica helmets. And Dewpoint Kevlar is made competently. Where, do, yeah, whereas just general Aramid fibers can be anything. So, yeah, back then when people were taking their really, really cheap uh, ballistic helmets from China and putting rounds through them, it was nasty. It did not get them a great reputation, so... This is like my seventh attempt at this video. Bear with me. I need I need to drink something. <laughs> so, what they did there? Okay, well, obviously we want the use the fast design. We'll have them take the Dupont Kevlar. We'll mash it into a helmet. We'll bring it back here, and we'll source our own third party uh, rails and stuff. What they did is they actually use something similar. Although this is a Gen Two, the uh, M Lock rails have been removed. We'll get back to that here in a second. They were you know, using basically just uh, generic arc rails, unlicensed. And they also used the same Opscore shroud that was out at the time. They used the same Opscore padding, but all of it was just generically made. Not great for a commercial market. That's a good way to get a quick cease and desist letter, which is what I'm assuming happened. And in the sense of reaching for more of a, uh, what should we call it? Legitimate brand name is when they came up with the Gen 2, they swapped all that around and made some significant improvements. So, with that in mind, one of the key things I will state when it comes to the HHV helmet is um, they came up with a rough start and they had a lot of public perception to get over with making helmets in China. I do think their end all goal, and what I, I'm seeing them working to right now, I think is ultimately going to be a positive. So, we're going to get to that here in a second. So. Making helmets out of aramid fibers isn't anything new from the Pasket that I got to I got to wear before we got the cool lightweight helmets for the Marine Corps and all that cool stuff. Um, yeah, Pasket helmets, they're like 3.6 pounds or something ridiculous. They put a lot of strain on your neck, but you gotta wear them for training, so you kinda just live with the pain. <laughs> 
you push on through that and um, you get the lightweight helmet. It's a bit better. It's still way too heavy, and they never have the right size because it's the Marine Corps. Uh, <laughs> so, the cool thing is, with how the, long the technology has been around, building a competent helmet out of aramid fibers, particularly ones put together and not just a generic name, isn't terribly hard to do. So when we look at the things for a helmet, you got to have um, uh, the NIJ certifications. Oh my god, this is going to be forever. So, we make a helmet out of aramid, gain it to pass NIJ testing isn't the hardest part. They're really balancing that weight and uh, protection sort of balance going on. So, one of the key questions people are asking about HHV helmets, is it NIJ certified? And um, if you look on Google, one of the first results that Google brings you to is like one of the soft rep things that says yes, but, but Google is not correct in this case. There's NIJ certified, then there's meets NIJ standard, with the difference being that meets NIJ standard means they're actually doing consistent testing. They do updated uh, checks, and checks and balances to make sure you're not skimping out, getting lazy with your helmet production. They'll randomly come in, pick uh, three large helmets. They always use large helmets for the test. And they make sure they're still passing uh, V0 penetration testing. Make sure that zero rounds penetrate the helmet from like 124 grain, 9 millimeter, generally at like 1400 feet per second. Can't have any penetrators. V50 testing still has to be uh, relatively high because you can't have more than half of the rounds penetrate through the helmet. And then, of course, you got the back face deformation. In 2012, according to a lot of the test results I was reading, they link between back face deformation and traumatic brain injury and behind the helmet. Blunt trauma was not well understood. Of course, we're 10 years later now, and the studies have been ongoing. And they basically were like, hey, yeah, no, back face deformation can be a really nasty thing if it's not addressed. So, with the aramid, and so basically... Not NIJ certified, no, 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 no. But meets NIJ standards. Means they did take their own, well, were the helmets hand selected or were they actually going through more of the rigid system where the testing company does it, is not known. That's one of our PIRs here. And um, if HHV does look through this video, they do have one guy I saw on Reddit who was constantly like addressing information and disinformation on HHV helmets. If he does come into this chat, then please feel free to put out as much information as you can in the comments below to help cover any of these uh, gaps that might be missing in all this uh, deep dive research I've done. But, um, yeah, so basically they took a helmet and they sent it to one of the three certified NIJ labs for ballistic testing. And now those labs, are, well, there's three. There's the Oregon Ballistic Laboratories, who does testing on uh, different helmets. They didn't do this one. These ones particularly were tested by the National Technical Systems. And I believe they use the Chesapeake branch? Because there's the Chesapeake and the Wichita for those two. And that's all three. Those are the only three laboratories that can do the testing. So they used an NIJ certified uh, company to run their test according to their standards. However, if you go on the HHV website and you download the testing, there's a big little block of text in bold that says, hey, these results do not imply certification. But even with that in mind, we're gonna strong we're gonna steel man that argument, which is the opposite of straw man, and we're gonna assume the best here. So they do the testing and the back face deformation results were actually really, really solid. So with this helmet, they got from a 124 grain nine millimeter, crown was 15.4 millimeters, sides were like 14, front modified for the shroud, so I think they hit it probably around here. They don't have pictures of it per se, but 14.8, uh, and the rear of the helmet they shot was at 8.52. Lots of numbers. Well, let's cover the Opscore SF, the newer high-speed helmet made out of, uh, where's that, where's that word I always forget, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, as well as your freaking carbon fiber and um, aramid, all that stuff mixed together to make this cool, lighter helmet. Shell, shell alone weighs like 1.27 pounds, whereas this guy, the shell, is upwards towards uh, three pounds. Actually, with the way my helmet's all set up with all its cool high-speed stuff, and this one's pretty stock, they actually weigh pretty close to the same. So with Opscore and their newer high-speed stuff chosen by Soft, 
This is one of the key things when they did say the backface deformation was better on the HHV helmet. They were not wrong. The ops core from their uh, testing going on, um, well, since it's constantly updated testing, they could be using either an average or they could be using worst case. I'm not sure if they're using best case, but for their testing, the crown was 23.4 millimeters. Sides were 27.1. Front was 29 and the rear was 19.1. So, significantly higher numbers. But what do we know from a lot of the testing and some of those uh, results I was reading into? So the average percentage, I got my ruler today, or the average number that you're looking for when it comes down to testing, what they use is sort of like the standard, is 25.4 millimeters. So that's uh, gonna be that guy right there. And you might be like, hey, 25.4, that's a pretty exact uh, metric number. Why did they choose that one? And when you flip it on over to this side, you'll effectively see that it's pretty much just an inch in Imperial. So they took an inch and immediately converted over to millimeters. And that's kind of considered like a standard average. I know when it comes to um, Team Windy and their ballistic helmet, their helmets are a bit heavier because they're using, where is it? Team Windy, where are you? Team Wendy's using their own little like proprietary blend of uh, polyethylene and aramid. I'm not too sure they're using any of the carbon fiber. But that's what they're using. So Team Wendy uses more aramid, so they get a bit better results as well. All of the Team Wendy stuff is rated as uh, stated on their NIG3 testing as below 25.4 on all sides. Of course, optimal for the left, right, and crown is like 15, 16 millimeters because usually that's where the padding's thinner and everything anyway. So, with that in mind, back face deformation, kind of like with the Olight Lumens, is not the end all be all. It's not, there's, there's the entire gestalt of the helmet, not to mention you still got to like pass compression testing and all that. When it comes to the environmental resistance and all that other helmet testing, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go out on a limb, I'm going to wager that the HHV actually fares just fine. Reason being, like I stated earlier, this isn't Arabid Fibers and DuPont Kevlar isn't the newest technology on the block. It's been around for a while. We've got lots of uh, time and information to work with, so producing a competent helmet isn't the hardest task in the world. So then you really just gotta get to pass quality control and you're looking pretty good. So I'm gonna assume the best for um, Arabid helmets as far as HHV is concerned, so yeah. Now, as far as the um, op score, fairing not as well in the protection, there was another test back in 2018 or so where they were looking at the impact of padding. And as far as padding goes, using just the standard like Zorbium zap pads that you find like standard issue with most helmets, if the round impacts directly on the pad, then um, you can actually walk away just fine. But if it hits a hollow point where there is no padding, then the back face deformation transfers pretty hard into the head, and you get moderate cranial fracturing. And as you might guess, that is not good. So more padding can arguably be said to be better without getting into too much of a deep dive there. So the padding plays a huge role, because the back face deformation is not the end all be all. Opscore came out with their cool little... Um, was it their Lux liner padding, which is like bicycle helmet padding? And then you got I have uh, aftermarket 40 comfort pads in here because they've got really good rating and stuff. So, and of course the helmet's got a very thin shell; it's lightweight, and that plays a huge role in the helmet holding up. Despite back, back phase deformation, a lot of the deformation be placed into the pad, and if the shell is cracking beyond the 25.4 millimeters. You've also got padding and stuff in the back that your head can sort of like push into to avoid getting completely ruptured, which is good. And um, yeah, if you don't have that, you have a bad day. So generally, key takeaway, more padding can generally be better. And uh, yeah, we got some room to work with in regards to this helmet. So of course, having less back face deformation makes that a bit easier. So let's actually take a look at the Gen 2 helmet here for a second. So the Gen 2 helmet, what it comes with is well, HHV taking a look at their basically knockoff op score that they came out with the Gen 1 and the perception that was being received given all the other replicas, they had to come up with a solution. They had to have their own 
in-house made parts. And in that case, instead of, in lieu of arc rails, although there are ironically arc rails here, they started using M-lock rails. Now the M-lock rails isn't like entirely new. You do see them used to an extent with uh, Team Windy. Team Windy helmets like to use that, so you can put in the M-lock attachments. So of course Unity makes their adapters for the uh, Peltors and the M3s and all that stuff. So you can still mount those on there. So it would, it should, in theory, work just fine with the M-Lock on the thing. Of course, my M-Lock for everything, I think it's really just ear pro and lights and stuff. As far as uh, visors and stuff, it looks like you're probably just going to be wearing you know, like normal glasses to make that all work out. Um, the shroud is a HHV proprietary option here. So I've got my G24 here, and there's been some Velcro added in there. But even with the Velcro, this can still be mounted in there, which is good. It does have a little rattle, however, so I think the Velcro is helping actually hold it a bit more stable without that Velcro at the base. I think it would actually rattle a bit more. But of course, you always got your bungees and stuff to help secure that. This is still the stock Velcro that comes with it. He's got his little Unity tags and stuff on there. There's a bit of um, Velcro coming up here, but that's because these arc rails have been installed after market. Yeah, replica arc rails, and uh, I don't even, I'm not, let's see, I got a little piece of a uh, Picatinny mounting here, and I actually haven't been able to get that to fit within those arc rails, so I think they might be slightly off-spec, although I heard the uh, Gen 1 had off-spec rails too, so there is that to bear in mind, but I think the M-Lock, a unique solution, for sure, because you can mount everything still M-Lock style. I personally prefer the arc rails myself, even uh, Cry Precision got uh, contracted their own arc rails via um, Opscore Gentex so they can run those on the airframe. Shroud, shroud's alright, three hole shroud, pretty basic. If you look here, since he, I, think, I don't know if he drilled the holes or if they were there previously, but you can see where he took the screws out from the uh, M-Lock setup and moved it over to the uh, Team Windy camp. Actually, I was curious to see... They use a weird magnetic chin strap, and some people love it. To me, it seems odd, and uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to take a look at that because we've got a Team Windy cam fit in here. The padding, the padding's the two-step two sort of process. You got your pads. I don't think it's Zorbium. I'm not sure what that material is. They got a decent, um, basically, impact protective liner going on here, and then you got your comfort pads. They're a lot more squishier on the inside. Actually, the comfort pads aren't bad at all. I'll give them that much. Those are some pretty decent comfort pads. As far as the ballistic credibility and everything of that, I cannot say. This is a size medium. Okay, I think their mediums might run a bit smaller, similar to Opscore as well, because I wasn't really able to get my head into this thing, so... Yeah, I think it might be a smaller sizing. But yeah, of course you got the Aramid fiber sort of like texturing and everything going on there. Lower bits of, uh... Cuts of Velcro. Velcro! It's a different quality, but it's not a bad quality by any stretch, so. Let's see, what else do we need to talk about? As far as, um, if you're curious about the NIJ testing, there is, but also isn't, helmet standards. NIJ standard 10, or 0106.01 is your helmet standard, generally modified to 3A to bring it sort of up to speed, because it's a really, really old standard for your helmet testing. Ballistic resistant protective materials is NIJ standard 0108. And then, of course, your body armor for your sappy plates and everything. And where AR500 really failed hard was 0101.06. So as far as the uh, means of uh, injury, you're generally, with 3A rated helmets, your goal is to ultimately, end of the day, not get ventilated, your, your dome Swiss cheesed. So, of course, they protect up to handguns, which you're not going to be getting shot at with too many handguns. Well, I mean, maybe law enforcement side, but less so active duty military. You're going to have a lot more fragmentations, rocks. Um, if a round hits you, t uh, as far as injuries to the head are concerned from uh, combat and stuff, only 10% come from direct hits. So a round comes in, ouch, bad day, particularly from a rifle. Um, that's, um, that's no bueno, but occasionally it could hit. It could, it could uh, go through the airmen and stuff and actually curve around your head if you're really lucky in a miracle shot. If, you, uh, if you've been attending prayer time regularly, it's more likely. <laughs> but um, yeah, if it goes straight through, um, ouch. It could potentially slow the projectile to where you still get cranial fracturing and stuff, but it doesn't uh, do bad things to your brain if you're really lucky. But again, it's not really right for that. 
90% of gunshot wounds to the head come from fragmentation, which is where the round doesn't impact your head, but it hits the wall and uh, shrapnel and stuff from the wall comes out. The round itself fragments into pieces and you get bits of that. If you're not wearing a helmet, you could um, get TBIs, you can get unalived and all that bad stuff. But with a helmet, it generally fares pretty well because that uh, fragmentation when they do all that testing and stuff, not too bad. Um, see, since it's like the seventh time I covered this, I might be repeating myself, but uh, yeah, fragments, fragments are bad. Um, as far as price range goes, oh yeah, so wait, if you don't have anything attached to your helmet, which again, the point of this helmet was designed to add ear pro, ear pro wasn't terribly heavy, so at three pounds, if you're just adding ear pro, you're not doing too bad. If you're adding nods, nods are almost always going to look like a, uh, bump helmet sort of thing, because the weight of the nods, you can remove that from the, uh, ballistic shell, and just run a little bump helmet, and have a decent, stable platform for nods. That's not going to put pain in your neck. The rule of thumb here is generally going to be the farther over three pounds in a helmet you go, the more significant the neck pain is going to become. So with even with the, uh, I think the enlisted helmet, what was it, the Mitch HCH? I don't remember how much the lightweight, lightweight helmet weighed, but it was still up close to three pounds. So even then, over extended periods of time, you start to get neck pain. The lighter Opscore uh, helmets, you can add a lot more stuff to it and not suffer neck pain until you get deeper and deeper in, so. Do, do, do. Let's see, Team Windy, their Expel helmet, the shell alone weighs 1.8 pounds, loaded it's like 2.75, the Opscore SF, 1.44 pounds from the shell, and then of course, when it's loaded, it's closer to like 2.4. Now, one of the cool things that Opscore did do, because as I mentioned, three pound helmet, um, is they recently came out with the RF1. So when you're looking at weight to ballistic protection, their helmet is designed to actually stop 7.62 rifle rounds, like direct hits. So that's pretty impressive. Bravo Zulu there. Of course, the helmet weighs like 3.5 pounds. So at the cost of an additional half a pound, you can get yourself, particularly if you're on like a machine gun and not too mobile, that could be a really, really solid benefit to have on your side. Same weight basically as a Pasket, old Pasket helmet but now it stops rifle rounds. So that's a pretty cool thing. So, um, of course, that's also like $3,500. Whereas with the um, HHV, I think they started at around 350 or so, and their newer ones, they're almost always on sale. They do do uh, veteran discounts and stuff, so. Without knowing what their veteran discount is, I knew they generally have it listed for like 550 something. Now, We've covered quite a bit about these helmets and stuff. Uh, we haven't really talked about crush testing. There's always an environmental resistance. So let's talk about that real quick. Environmental resistance, pretty the op score, what they've got stated is you can get to like negative 51 Celsius without compromising ballistic intensity. You can get all the ways up to 71 Celsius, which is just like unbearably hot. And you're still not gonna have um, ballistic de degradation. Uh, shock resistant, flame resistant, altitude seawater, field agents. Seawater is a big one, especially Marine Corps wise. You're going to be spending a lot of time on the ocean. Having that not destroy your helmet is cool. Might jack up the pads a bit. Might have to wash those out, but uh, for the most part, pretty legit. So with all this going on, as we know, they came up with the Gen 1. Gen 1 was too much of a replica to really get too far, but it got their, uh, they got, got their feet in the door, I'd say is the key thing. Gen 2. It's looking a bit better. I think the ballistic protection is still going to be relatively close, assuming the best that they're doing the decent quality control. Judging by this helmet, they're not doing bad. Obviously, this one looks pretty good to me. But, um, yeah, so... Future plans for HHV. One of the things they're stating. They've recently uh, been working on a factory. They're actually slated to start production A to Z from uh, Sweetwater, Texas. You got a whole factory, gonna be up and running. They're gonna start producing helmets from a uh, ballistic material, and um, it looks like they're actually gonna be made in America. So that could actually make them very compliant, which would be pretty Gucci. Of course, we might be looking at the price going up a bit, but uh, we shall see. So with this information in mind, thoughts on the Generation 2. Um, would I personally buy one to wear? Uh, not particularly. I think they are going the right direction. Um, I do like my... I think I just like my Opscore too much, but I do I do like the direction they're going. Because they started made in China, American materials, okay. 
There's I mean, the Reddit comments, my God. Well, that's where they started, and um, now with the Gen 2, they are making improvements, having their own M-Lock system and Shroud, I think, is a significant step in the right direction, especially as well as um, forging out their own identity amongst all these ballistic helmets. Um, a few of the nameless Chinese ballistic helmets got tested. I know they tested one in uh, the Oregon Ballistic... Uh, was it? What did I even say the name of The Oregon Facility. Yeah, Oregon Ballistic Laboratories they did a test of, like, a nameless, brandless helmet there and actually passed. They didn't give any details on how much backface deformation... But as far as the V0 testing, they didn't have a penetrator, so it's kind of worth its grain. Take it with a grain of salt. But I do like the direction they're going. I think as long as they're sticking to only like aramid fibers, they're going to have a really hard time getting under three pounds. But if you're only like running Ear Pro and maybe some glasses, you're going to be doing all right. When you start adding in like nods and uh, crazy heavier materials, counterweights and stuff like that, I think that's when you're going to start getting some significant back pain. There's always the chance that as a uh, ballistic helmet technology continues to improve, they could start moving to lighter materials without sacrificing too much protection. And as someone once said many years ago, um, would you rather have 100% protection 70% of the time or like 90% protection 100% of the time? That's kind of like, they actually had a HHV did have an article out don't remember who wrote it, but that's basically the question they're asking. And if the answer is like an extra half a pound isn't going to kill you, then and you got to spare thirty five hundred dollars, you could get a RF one helmet. So cool stuff, man. My throat really hurts from doing this like seven times, but I think this is the one we're going to go with, folks. So yeah, oh yeah, they're padding. They're padding. Padding doesn't suck. I like the uh, forty pads, and of course you can always swap out the padding with something else if you really wanted to. But do bear in mind. If you go cheap with the padding, then a lot of that uh, the benefits they have for the back face defamation are going to be significantly defeated, and you're going to increase your risk of uh, significant damage. With the uh, foam sort of liner thing they got with the obscure, that stuff can break and move out of the way. Your head can move a bit faster, back farther. Um, I do know they had, um, with rifle testing, they were able to get, um, to an extent, they could keep penetration down to a minimum, but with the back face deformation, and more importantly, the speed with which the round's impacting your head, there's just not enough time for your skull to move back out of the way, and that's where a lot of the damage comes from, so. Final thoughts on the HSV helmets. I like the direction they're going. If they start producing the stateside, like they plan to later this year, I would definitely be interested in, I guess, what, the, what would they call it, the Gen 3? I think the Gen 3 helmets will be pretty significant. Oh. I don't think I mentioned. For the back face deformation, I said 10.5 was kind of like the standard, but a lot of the testing and stuff they had got out to, or is it like 4.4 millimeters, is when you start having a significant risk to uh, your dome and brain. So, well, I did say the op score didn't fare as well, but bear in mind the op score still stayed significantly under 44 millimeters, so ultimately I would wager you're going to be fine. There's a lot of deep diving here, so hopefully, if nothing else, this video's been able to answer a few of your questions. If you were, like the uh, Good Sir Knight of the past, and you were like, made in China, I don't care, well, they're going the right direction, and um, I do think it is going to hold up to the degree they state. Um, so future HHV, I'm pretty sure they're going to do their Gen 3, they're going to start having everything made in America, which is good on them, honestly. And I think if they go from the meets NIJ standards and they actually push hard for the NIJ certification, it's going to be really hard to say no to one of their helmets. I mean, the price will probably also go up to like $700, $800, who's, who can say? But even so, a helmet like that that's going to uh, meet all these standards we made in America, America, it's going to be pretty legit stuff. So as of right now, you could get an, an eight. ATE, actually, I, like, I didn't mention, they don't use that rubberized stuff. They have this weird, crazy hard material for sealing the uh, aramid fibers in. It looks pretty steady. A um, little bit of uh, minute paint cracking on the sides. I don't see any, like, damage to it, so. In the future, when they come up with the Gen 3, I'll definitely be very interested to see what they have out as far as Made in America and if they actually do push for the NIJ standard or NIJ certified stuff. Because if they go that direction... 
then yeah, there's not going to be a whole lot of reasons to say no and not buy that helmet, especially if it stays in the lower price bracket. But as it is now, I mean, made overseas in China, I do think we're looking at more of a, as I said, a hollow sun situation as opposed to the general assumed nameless brandless NIJ 3A helmets and the, um, whatchamacallit, the, oh god, Olight sort of shenanigans going on there. So I do think they're going the right direction. They do put out a lot of interesting information. They tend to cover more medieval helmets and stuff, but the fact that they are, well, effectively trying is what's going to ultimately give me, or give me to give them a big old thumbs up. Veteran community, always good. Don't want to... I mean, the veteran community, when it comes to veteran-owned and operated, it does have a bit of a taboo to it that you see from time to time. It's quick money-making scams, but it seems to me, on an honest-to-God level, that these guys are looking to effectively get out good efficient helmets to good people so that's what i got for you guys hopefully this video has helped you out some again thanks to my uh, buddy who let me borrow this for this testing purposes oh and in regards to videos of shooting helmets key, th key takeaway it's not a lab some people as we saw with ar500 and fortunately good thing there's so many so many autists online who will go ahead and crunch all these crazy numbers people will put in uh they'll actually take several grains of gunpowder and so they drop muzzle velocity in the sense of passing their test and ultimately it's not a laboratory on the plus side that's probably the conditions your helmet's gonna get shot in if you were wearing it in a bad day but at the same time it's not laboratory testing heat humidity and all sorts of things factor in and those can all be controlled in a laboratory setting not to mention the clay and stuff they use for the testing so this has been a massive headache for me but i'm glad we have this all put together and this video's done and i think i covered all the topics if i forgot anything um i'll add it to the video description later so check there if you feel like there's something i haven't covered and maybe i'll bring it up but yeah so like i said we'll see what happens later this year maybe they'll come out with something really really cool and until then I've got my Opscore and my amps and all my super comfy head goodness. That was a lot of pads. Huh? But yeah, um, if you have any questions for me, feel free to message me. This is probably going to be the last video I get out for at least a couple weeks. As I said, I'll be moving apartments here in a bit, so we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, um, people have very polarized thoughts on HHV. But you go ahead, Steel Madam, say... Uh, interested to see where they're going, what they come out with, and I think they're ultimately, ultimately trying to be good guys. So, cheers everyone, stay chivalrous, America. That's all I got for you guys. Um, you can stop the video, it's gonna take me a minute to get over there, I've been like sitting for a hot minute. What time is it? It's um, I've been trying to film this for two and a half hours. All right, so, peace out everyone, stay Gucci, uh, and remember, more importantly than just all that stuff, get training. You need to train. You don't need to worry about the kind of damages that's going to happen to your body armor if you're trained enough to not get yourself in a situation where your body armor has to be a factor. So get training, shoot guns, um, eat bacon, uh, other important things. What does it say? Yeah, use your Second Amendment rights. Um, if you're in a if you're still like in the stateside, I can't do too much out here. <sighs> gotta make a trip. Gotta make a trip. Gotta get that stuff done. So, America, America. And uh, I had one more thing that was important. Can't remember it. It's the reason I'm holding off on the end of the video. Um, oh, what did it involve? Um, yeah, training. Training. I cover. I can't cover training anymore. Uh, oh yeah. Most importantly. Above anything, for those who are still lurking, who haven't clicked off the video, most importantly, and this is the most, probably the best information I give you in life, all, pretty much every single one of your problems is the result of you not drinking enough water. Water and LaCroix. Not sponsored, but LaCroix. Think about it. Ah, cheers, everyone. See you later. Peace!